Hello, my name is Benedict Westphalen. I'm a molecular biologist and medical oncologist by training, and I run the Precision Oncology Program at University of Munich. It's my great pleasure to be invited by eCancer to discuss the near future of precision oncology with a focus and on access and scaling, a topic that is very dear to my heart. These are my conflicts of interest, none of which have influenced today's talk. We believe, and we've recently published on this topic in Nature Medicine with a European group of oncologists, but also health economists, that wide and equal patient access to diagnostic te technologies and therapeutics is really a key aspect in delivering precision oncology to patients with cancer. And this can really not only happen in ivory towers in a few academic centers, we really have to um, think about how we scale precision oncology and um, the prospect of helping more of our patients in the future. When we talk about precision oncology in a more narrow sense, um, it's mostly therapeutics based on complex biomarkers. And most of the time, these complex biomarkers are found by comprehensive genomic profiling. And if you as a caregiver um, are thinking about implementing precision oncology in your daily practice, there are a couple of questions that you have to ask yourself. First, do I have access to quality insured testing? If your tests are not fit for purpose, you will miss patients or you might overdiagnose someone. Secondly, and I feel this is also really important, do I have the expertise to act on the results? The field, as I'm going to show you in a second, is rapidly moving. And um, a biomarker that was completely useless a couple of um, weeks or months ago might now be a very important therapeutic target. And thus, um, it's important to know where to get um, expertise, for example, in the setting of a molecular tumor board. And then last but not least, and this is really, really critical, do my patients have access to treatment? Because if you're testing biomarkers and you cannot give um, therapeutics based on them, the whole process becomes futile. Once you have answered these questions and went ahead um, with the testing, then the question is, what information can I get from the testing? So firstly, do I test according um, to standard of care? And I'm going to show you that standard of care is rapidly changing. Do I test, and I feel this is really important to screen for clinical trials because all these innovative drugs are um, coming into the market, but they have to run through clinical trials and maybe you find patients that um, can be treated based on a biomarker. And last but not least, does my testing inform my clinical management as of today or maybe tomorrow? So I briefly alluded to that standard of care is rapidly changing. I really refer to it as a moving target. If you look at this data um, from the nature medicine perspective that um, I alluded to, this is only over the last um, two years from uh, 2019 till um, end of 2021, 20, um, um, the number of new targeted agents in oncology that have been approved and are now part of guidelines. And as I briefly said, it's really difficult to keep up with the speed that we're seeing at the moment. So um, if you reach out to colleagues that are, um, in fact, experts in precision oncology, that can help your, um, um, to manage your patients a little bit better and um, can help you to really yeah, work in a team to make the most of, of um, a comprehensive genomic profiling test. But it doesn't stop here. So what we really believe, and this is um, a quote from one of the heroes of precision oncology, that you really need information to manage your patients properly. And if you're serious about treating cancer, as Vivek Sabaya said, you need all information available and genomic data are really an integral part of that information. And I couldn't agree more. Why is this so important? I spoke um, on clinical trials, and this is um, legendary data from the MSKCC impact program, where every patient in this um, hospital undergoes comprehensive genomic profiling. And by doing so and screening large amount of um, patients, um, these uh, colleagues are able to enroll um, more than 10% of their patients in molecularly guided clinical trials 
even if um, the target that is approached, such as NTRK fusions or red fusions, X is, is extremely rare. And to put this into perspective, in a large um, comprehensive cancer center, if you um, batch all patients that are um, enrolled into clinical trials, a lot of cancer centers do not make the cut of 10%. And here you see 11% of patients being enrolled in um, this very, very competitive and hard to enroll um, field of molecularly guided clinical trials. And this information that you're collecting with comprehensive genomic profiling might not only be relevant as of today, but also relevant uh, tomorrow. We are now seeing a lot of new drugs targeting KRAS. And that means um, the potential to treat three and a half million patients with RAS mutant um, cancers a year. So if you are doing the comprehensive genomic profiling and you find a biomarker that might not be relevant as of today, it might be highly relevant as of tomorrow. So to sum up the first part of my presentation, the landscape of molecular insights and molecularly guided um, therapeutics is rapidly evolving. Current guidelines can only insufficiently capture this evolution in time, so we need living guidelines. Access to quality ensure testing, expertise in treatment are pivotal. Comprehensive tumor profiling as of today can inform standard of care, support screening um, for clinical trials, and provide caregivers with additional clinical information. And what we really need to do is to stop to artificially divide diagnostic testing from treatment planning and execution and aim for a more integrated care approach. So next slide. What does that mean? How do we scale precision oncology? I believe we really are at um, the crossroads thinking about how we can um, deliver the promise of precision oncology, which is finally coming to reality to our patients. First and foremost, we have to get out of the silos. This cannot happen that we really work as single doctors or teams within one hospital, we really have to put all of our forces together and march ahead and um, combine our data, combine our efforts to help our patients get access to um, these novel diagnostics and therapies in order, as I said, to deliver on the promise. And how important this is, and the first priority here really would be access to innovative um, therapeutics. This is old data um, from clinical trials um, run until maybe 2019, um, where you can really see that the problem is not that you have patients undergoing testing or that they um, have a targetable alteration, roughly 40% of our patients do, but then really the drop is that only a fraction of the patients receive a matched um, drug in the end. In these old clinical trials, response rates were low, mostly because um, it was not the most innovative treatments done um, at the time because of access. How can we then ensure access to innovative therapeutics? One way that was pioneered in the Netherlands are so-called drug discovery protocols, where you use approved drugs in a novel indication, mostly based on biomarkers. So you give access to your patients, you collect the data at the same time, you collect safety information, and if um, the drugs really in fact work in the um, patients in a very, very structured manner, insurance companies are then, after 16 weeks of treatment, taking over the reimbursements of these drugs. So this is really a, an integrative part, an integrated part um, where patients get access but the information based on their treatment is not lost. So how can we scale up? And this is maybe the near future that I would want to um, show you. There might be ways of automization, um, and they can help us with diagnostics, diagnoses, and treatment of cancer. I just want to concentrate on one fact here, um, namely deep learning, predicting certain biomarkers in um, the diagnostics of or diagnosis of cancer. And this is brilliant data by Jakob Carter um, and team. We're able to show that you can um, predict microsatellite instability directly from um, histology slides without running a PCR or without doing a, an immunohistochemistry. 
Why is this important? I would briefly want to show you data from Miriam Shalabi presented at this year's ESMO, where she presented the final analyses of the NICHE 2 study with neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibition in locally advanced MMR deficient colorectal cancer. So those are patients that would normally undergo upfront resection. But I'm going to show you data in a second that we really have to rethink if these patients shouldn't be diagnosed for um, MSI status and a high fraction of patients in the early setting of colorectal cancer are actually DMMR MSI. And why is it so important to find them before? And this led to standing ovations at this year's ESMO, the so-called Shalabi plot. So 95% of patients with just one dose of immunotherapy are actually um, responding um, with a major pathologic response. And in two thirds of the patients, you find no cancer at all. So it's really a question of democracy to identify patients um, that are biomarker positive and this goes beyond just DMMR, MSI to target the treatments um, that will be most effectively in these um, subgroups of uh, patients. And with this, if you could automize it to a certain extent, for example, with deep learning, artificial intelligence, molecular pathology, um, that could really uh, help in the future. And with this, I would like to sum up. Precision oncology is really a concept that has the potential to fundamentally change our approach and perception to public health. We're talking personalized treatment, but we're also um, talking personalized early detection and personalized prevention. And I would uh, guide you to the talk by Charlie Swanton that he gave at this year's ESMO. And by the realization that, that precision oncology and precision um, prevention can really help to change our um, healthcare system, this realization has really socioeconomic and ethical implications. So all patients should have same access. It underscores the need for integrated healthcare solutions. So a testing is useless if you don't um, do it to inform your management and treatment. It underscores the need for true collaboration and the need for multi-stakeholder and trans-sectoral approaches. And with this, I thank eCancer a lot for giving me the opportunity to present to you today and wish you a very, very nice day. Thank you very much.